So what I suggest to get real the energy, why don't you all get up for one moment and stretch? <laughs> Doesn't that feel much better? <laughs> Dominoes. So many interesting talks, so much to learn. Um, I almost feel tempted not to talk about a big theory or something that I know. Maybe I can give some ideas. I brought a few slides. I brought no written notes. I hope I will not run over terribly. Um, this is where we were last year at TEDx Vienna. Let's see where we can take it from here. All our knowledge, everything we know is here in books. That's an Augustinus from, I think, uh, early 17th century. Um, so it's not about knowing. But then uh, we heard today about stuff we can learn from Kenya, stuff we can learn from kids, stuff uh, we can learn from uh, yelling drivers in a, a traffic jam. Uh, maybe it's not so much about knowing. We heard about uh, suffering. Suffering, at least this is a, the Buddhist way of looking at it, it's all about attachment. Uh, maybe it's about not knowing. This is a very, very old conversation about between two guys, where one uh, is going on a pilgrimage, and the other one says, where are you going? I'm going on a pilgrimage. What's the purpose of your pilgrimage? I don't know. And the other one says, not knowing is most intimate, meaning it's most authentic, it's most personal, it's most direct. And uh, I believe if we can approach a few things by accepting that we don't know, that we, um, we maintain this uh, beginner's mind, what this girl talked about. Yeah? Now that's another story. It's 6 o'clock in the morning, my daughter's getting up, going to school, she is going to be 7 next, uh, next week. And when she was in kindergarten, she came home around Christmas and so said to me, Daddy, did you know that the energy in the universe is constant? <laughs> and uh, I thought, maybe she's in the wrong kindergarten. <laughs> they had science fair also at kindergarten, yeah. Um, so, books. Um, yeah, that's how we know books today. And uh, with the development of electronic books, where we say, OK, so we take the books and put them in electronic media. That doesn't work. When we do electronic books, and there's no questions that electronic books are coming. My daughter let me borrow her iPad uh, for the presentation. Uh, there is no question that electronic books are coming. But there are many things that we win and many things that we lose. There will be no old book stores, there will be no second-hand bookstores. The concept will disappear. The experience of holding a book in leather will disappear. Things will change. And uh, I can't get around on quoting uh, Plato again, who already showed up this morning. Uh, I'll take it slight difference. I'm not so much concerned about uh, the worries about a new medium but about the potential of a new medium. And what came out of this was the 2,000 years of uh, artificial memory. Uh, the ability to memorize a speech was as important as rhetoric. It was an integral part of rhetoric. The same way as reading a book, re uh, internalizing, understanding a written text is essential today uh, in any academic work. Uh, and this will change, uh, not so much because the books that we know go electronic today, but in the way we perceive knowledge. Our knowledge, our history is the written word. This is the reason why so many people are concerned about uh, electronic publishing. And I've been doing electronic publishing since uh, 1988. I was part of the team that developed the first electronic books in California at the Voyager Company. 
and we did Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Jurassic Park, and Alice in Wonderland. And uh, I still don't own a Kindle. Uh, but there is no question that we enter the realm of computers. And that's a Cray-1 from the uh, Lawrence Livermore Laboratory that is now at a farm uh, uh, in the Santa Cruz Mountains. If you ever come into the area, let me know. I'm happy to organize a little trip to this farm where they keep an amazing amount of computers and some Vietnamese uh, black uh, pigs. <laughs> Guys are pretty amazing, yeah. So, uh, and my daughter loved it. Um, so, we may enter into an area that in 200 years will be perceived as history free. Because there are no artifacts. When you think about it, yeah? everything is electronic, and of course, we store everything. And as you know, whenever you have everything, you have nothing. Yeah? Uh, I don't know how much old stuff you have at home, but uh, I have quite a few CD ROMs that nobody can read anymore. I have quite a few computers that nobody can run anymore. And uh, when you look at uh, these two things, one is a coin of the 16th century. Uh, Charles V was a very, very important figure in the development of payment systems. And on the other side, a Visicalc by Bob Frankson. I know Bob personally. I don't know, I uh, didn't meet Charles V. But it's definitely easier to research about the coins of Charles V than uh, the early development of spreadsheets. Try to write a paper about that. It's virtually impossible to replicate how these things worked. More disks. From five megabyte, this is a big thing. I was considering to bring it. I have it at home, but I thought, I was, honestly, I was too lazy. Uh, <laughs> and a, a Blu-ray disk, uh, with 10,000 times the space. And still, uh, the big one, of course, nobody can read anymore. The Blu-ray, you can buy a player today. In five years, nobody will be able to read it. So, there is a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. And it's not about the stuff. What it's really about is the stories. And now the question is whether this we have the sound. This flower was really magic, but it didn't have any kind of magic. It had the magic of the heart. The flower had a home deep, deep in the jungle, but only one person could find it, the, f the flower, because it, it was really deep in the jungle. And only a person that had a good heart could find it. There's the picture. So that was a book my daughter made for me. She woke me up in the morning and told me, I made a book for you. And she did it on paper. And she invented the story and did the drawing and read it to me. And it's almost irrelevant on which medium it is. It's about the ability to tell stories. And we are just beginning to learn how we tell stories with new media. This was one of the very first electronic publications that were independent from a computer. That cartoon is from the Standard in 1993 when I published a uh, book about uh, Schönbrunn Castle on a photo CD by Kodak that would be connected to a TV. It would not need a computer. It was unheard of. And needless to say, nobody can play it anymore. There are no more players. Nobody knows how it works. Uh, and, uh, but uh, they found this very interesting. And uh, I ended up buying the cartoon from the artist because I wanted to have, guess what, the original. So it's a lot about media transition. How do we go from old media to new media? And this is the most difficult part and has never been really solved. And we have to just acknowledge it and accept it. In the early stages of, theater, uh, of a film, Georges Méliès, when he found out about a camera, so great idea, because this guy basically had little stages at uh, fun fairs. He thought, hey, I make a, uh, uh, a movie of my actors, and then I only have to pay them once, just show the movie. It took them about 15 years to figure out that you can actually move the camera. They put the camera. 
And uh, it took them another 15 years to figure out how to do montage. So we have to accept that it takes some time to understand how we manage our content. At the moment, we're still in the golden age of search. Just put everything on the internet and run a really good search engine. And you see that in the evaluation of Google. Then comes the silver age where we can't find anything and eventually uh, we'll, we'll get into a space where we organize our information in an adequate way. And I just talked to two people and I apologize that I forgot your name, who built a company here in Vienna that helps people find stuff on the internet. So you don't have to search anymore yourself, you have somebody who knows how to search to find you the stuff. Ultimately, it's all about how you use a certain medium. And we are always sitting in front, mesmerized, and think, how does this thing work? Ultimately, every medium is a social medium. And we hear a lot, of course, today about Facebook and the pros and cons, and uh, uh, anybody who has a kid knows uh, there is a certain addiction to constant communication, but it's not new. To create secondary channels of communication, uh, to build medias that are ultimately social, has been around for quite some time. Take a look at this. So this guy makes quite nice money on the side by uh, working a secondary communication channel. Uh, and uh, I have the whole video if you want to see the rest. But uh, what it's really all about is building a bridge, building an intelligent bridge between where we are with the traditional medium, where we are with the new medium, and how we can turn digital media into memory spaces, into historic uh, information spaces, so that we both have uh, today's uh, social communication in an effective way, without getting overwhelmed, as we heard earlier today about uh, email, and at the same time also create a social repository. Because ultimately, learning, evolution, whether it's social, whether it's educational, always depends on a historic tradition. Thank you. Are there any <laughs> solutions? <laughs> yeah, so what do we do? Uh, we have to create a historic aspect. We when you look, it's very interesting, you can try that. Go on the internet, check out something you will find. Everything is written as if it's the first day. Even professionally run newspapers have stories and there is no date. You look something up and it's written as if today was the first day of the internet and everything is in the present. And then you check, oh my God, this is 10 years old. There is 10 year old stuff on the internet. And if we don't have a time axis and we don't understand that it's old, then we can't put it in perspective. We have to actualize the specifics of the medium. We have to understand what the medium does and what it does to us. And how can we keep it? Uh, feeble attempts have been made. The Austrian National Library tried, in their own tradition, to produce CD-ROMs of the internet content. That, of course, is a, turns very fast into a futile exercise. But that's how they worked. I worked at the National Library, in a sense of full disclosure, and uh, when they had the little card catalogs, they wouldn't use, and there, of course every card is multiple ones, by title, by author, by subject, they would not use photocopiers. They had a printing press to press, to produce five cards of each. And I asked them why, I said, photocopying is not very good because about after 120 years, the stuff falls off. So it's th they think in 500 years, but at the same time, they could not get, could not get a handle of the internet. Uh, there is the Internet Archive, which works so and so, so, so you can see what a website looked like five years ago. But 
basically relying on the internet as we know it today by trying to apply old models is like planting a pole firmly into flowing water. You get nowhere. So we have to completely rethink how we deal with it. And we have to implement some form of organic decay. Because when it's paper, very clear. What's relevant, and there are mistakes, because it's always what's relevant to the leading uh, society, the leading form, the leading people. It's, this is not democratic, no question. But there is a certain form where irrelevant stuff gets thrown away. Look at yourself. Yeah? You make a note on the back of a little slip, you throw it away. Yeah? If it's an email, you keep it. Yeah? Uh, if it's a fax, you, well, the good thing with faxes is, the, at least the old ones, yeah, they died. You, know, the, 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 you couldn't read it anymore. Yeah? But uh, post-it notes being thrown away. Voicemail, happily enough, from time to time, they get destroyed by the phone company. But uh, anything that's email yeah, gets being kept. Yeah? And there is no way to separate the important from the unimportant. So we have to develop responsible modes of usage. And we have ultimately to accept impermanence of everything. So I want to uh, I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you.